Hello. Thanks for having me here. Uh, I was here last year and it was fun. Uh, well, I was asked to do a brief talk at the beginning of this about, about the state of DevOps. So that'll be hopefully just 10 minutes. Otherwise, I have too many slides in the second part. Uh, which is, uh, th this past year, or not this past year, I decided uh, to come up with a talk about like uh, why people don't change. Because I'll, I'll get into, uh, that seems to be a common complaint, is uh, we have all these fantastic ideas, but those people over there are being sticks in the mud. So what's their deal? Uh, so I think it's nice to uh, kind of understand what's going on there. Well, uh, briefly, here's me. Normally I'd be wearing that shirt, but my dog actually ripped it up after about 15 years uh, before I came here, which is tragic. I don't know what to do about that. But uh, I'm, I'm pretty lucky over the past almost 10 years or so, I worked at Pivotal and then VMware, and now, as we say, VMware Tanzu by Broadcom. Uh, and I've had the chance to really talk with large organizations and people there and management, and developers and technical people, to put it in a very basic way about how they're getting better at the way they do their software, their apps, and everything involved in that stack up and down. And I've written a few little books about it that you can get mostly for free if you uh, go to my website and hunt them down. And then I also do uh, a, a podcast, Software Defined Talk, and some other ones. And uh, I don't know, I've been an analyst at Red Monk, I did m and at Dell, and uh, I was a programmer a long, long time ago. And now I make slides. Uh, so, as one of my friends said, I used to be good at my job, and now I'm good at PowerPoint. Uh, so, I'll give you a brief idea of what I think, maybe not so much the state, but very definitions of what people think DevOps is uh, in about now, uh, essentially. And like I said, I spend my time talking with mostly like management and executives uh, and people like enterprise architects, things like that in large or very large organizations. And it's, uh, if you're into this kind of thing, it's pretty thrilling to see what their idea of DevOps is, uh, especially if they're trying to apply it and think about it. So, I mean, the state of DevOps is that it's just part of what is there. It's part of the supply of, of life and existence. So it's fine, right? It's sort of like asking what the state of the English language is. Uh, but I think more importantly, how people use DevOps and how they're planning on using it, what they think about it, so that you can choose that uh, and kind of adapt to it is the, uh, the more interesting uh, part of it. So first, uh, well, that's unfortunate. Uh, so first, this is perhaps the most common thing that I encounter, and that's thinking about DevOps as a centralized developer tools group, right? Which is a long way from the beginning of DevOps, uh, which was like, you know, configuring your servers, uh, essentially, to maybe put it down too much. Uh, but you see this over and over again, especially with the people that I talk with. Uh, but then also, there's actually even, you know that your, 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 uh, your community, your market, your tool chain is stabilized when you have a multi-year Gartner Magic Quadrant. Uh, and this view that they have of what DevOps is, is in their, um, what do they call it, the DevOps Platforms uh, Magic Quadrant. And you can kind of read through there uh, that if you have kind of a developer mindset, you're like, oh, it's everything I use except the actual programming language, right? And the kind of lesser version of this is really like the pipeline, the way you build and automate and deploy applications. And that's, this is, again, this is all anecdotal, uh, but this is really what I encounter the most when people say they have a DevOps team or they have DevOps engineers or even more thrillingly, they're introducing DevOps uh, and how they're doing. They think about it as, as managing these tools. Now, of course, I think this, is what most insider people in the DevOps community think that DevOps is, or I should say, think of as DevOps. And that is to think about DevOps as culture, right? And if you've uh, uh, been in this community long enough, you'll remember mm, maybe, I forget the exact year, but you know, they started doing the DevOps report as a, uh, you know, if you put out reports, it's a great form of marketing. But at some point from Puppet, the DevOps report shifted from a, a good sort of lead Jenny marketing thing into an actual report. And it really moved very quickly into talking about not the tools, not things like that, but the kind of culture, the way that people think about how they do their job, the way they kind of build up the, the, the human dynamics, all of that kind of group stuff. And you know, of course, this is kind of like the, uh, the hallmark, along with that, uh, that chart that you see in, in the, uh, the DevOps report every year, which I always think of as the awesome people are awesome chart. 
that shows you if you're following all the good DevOps practices, you do great at your company. Uh, I always want to see the, the data about connecting it to like uh, revenue generation and share price and things like that, but uh, I haven't really come across that yet. Not that it would diminish things, but it just would be interesting to see the uh, relationship between those. And again, this is like the really DevOpsy DevOps people think about it as this way, right? This is where you get these ideas of like, it's not about the tools, it's about the culture and it's all about the people. And I'll get into a little bit of this with the, the fear and change thing. Uh, now, I also always like to point out, can you guess which one of these you're supposed to be and which ones are bad? It's, it's like, uh, you know, one, one of the funner things about this uh, Westroom chart. Uh, so the next kind of view is that a lot of what DevOps is, is kind of the opposite of the culture thing, is really about the tools, namely getting the tools to be easier to use. And this has really emerged, I think I was talking uh, before this talk, I realize you can't use this. Here's a pro tip about presentations. Like I said, I'm good at PowerPoint. They say, they say many things, but they say you're not supposed to have a slide that no one can read. And I say they're wrong, because then what you can do as a speaker is tell people what's in the slide, and you've just got this chart to pretend like you know what you're talking about, which I will demonstrate now. Uh, so what you see, this is a survey that we've done about Kubernetes uh, at VMware and now VMware Tanzu by Broadcom. Uh, and you can see the way that you read this chart is that these are benefits people have gotten, and the top one is the most recent. And you see that the benefits have been going down for using Kubernetes, right? So, and I think there's an explanation there. As more and more people use Kubernetes, as it goes more and more mainstream, you have more people using it. So there's various degrees of skills and tolerance about putting up with the, um, idiosyncratic stuff uh, and just the, the nature of Kubernetes. So you get more people who uh, are encountering a lack of benefits from it. And I think a lot of, another view of DevOps that I encounter is that it's all about fixing this or kind of filling out, uh, you know, making YAML easier to use, I guess, and making it so that application developers spend less time worrying about this, making it sure that in larger organizations there's common governance over, you know, just making sure it delivers on, on the dream. Um, and I think that emerges, you know, th this is just a, a quick side note, right? Like, it's, it's to some extent, it's been weird that this has happened, because if you, if you remember, the Kubernetes people are always telling you, this is not for you. You shouldn't be using this. This is a platform for building platforms, and sorry about that. Uh, but I don't know, it's not only us DevOps people, but as a kind of global IT community, uh, we seem to tune that out and uh, instead think like, yes, this is for me. I, I wanna build on top of this and, and work it, not just have it be a lower level thing. But I think uh, a lot of DevOps people have come in and kind of filled out uh, those, uh, those hopes that you can kind of make it easier to use and uh, get, get the benefits that uh, people are talking about it. Now, I'll get into this a little bit further in the second uh, part of the presentation, but this is a little bit more of an emerging thing that, that DevOps is. Uh, and that is, it is kind of that thing above whatever your infrastructure layer is. And thinking about, well, if I have application developers, uh, they're gonna need to use this infrastructure and I would like to make it easier for them and I'm gonna build a platform on top of it. Now, of course, there's a, you know, everyone's probably seen this. Uh, this platform concept killed off DevOps, so I'm not sure why we're here having this conference. Maybe it's just for good times. Uh, we enjoy talking about the old days. Uh, we're doing sort of reenactments or something. But, you know, I think, I think the, uh, the, the people at Humanitech and other people have kind of backed off of this DevOps is dead thing and introduced this, uh, this platform notion. But I think generally this is where I see kind of, uh, let's say intermediate to advanced DevOps people getting more involved in is building up and managing this platform uh, that developers start using more. And this is, again, I'll come back to this, but this is, this is great. This is from the uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation uh, from last year. Uh, and it's a, it's a diagram of what a, what a platform is. It's really great, because since I work at VMware Tanzu by Broadcom, uh, I often get asked to give talks like this, and they say, don't give a vendor talk, because everyone's head will explode. So now instead of using our architecture, I can use this one, and they all look the same. Uh, so we have a great one, uh, but I'm not gonna show it to you here. Uh, but you can see the platform basically uh, is all the infrastructure stuff, which doesn't really even show up, and everything that you need to manage your, your custom-built and uh, custom-run applications. And so those are four things that I've noticed DevOps being in recent years, right? And again, I think 
the, the state of DevOps is it's fantastic. Everyone's done a great job, so give yourself a pat on the back or however you like to congratulate yourself. Um, and now, going over those four things and maybe other ones, I think it's great to think about like, so what am I doing? What do I want to evolve to? How do I want to change the way that I do DevOps? And more importantly, if I'm in a situation, you got to be really careful when this comes up because you don't want to be the kind of annoying person who's like, um, you haven't read the correct passage and you're wrong about what it is. But as you're introducing DevOps into larger organizations or any organization, it's good to have an idea of what that might mean and uh, uh, what that is. So next, the, the kind of main thing I want to go over is uh, this idea of like why people don't change and why they fear change, right? Like, what is the deal now that, let's say, you pick one of your four uh, meanings of DevOps uh, and you're like, we're going to go in there. Uh, well, I'll give you the extreme case. We've got, a, we've got this mainframe system that uh, our big insurance company runs at its core that makes sure our business functions. And like, I don't know, we don't like that anymore for some reason. Usually it's about cost and uh, people retiring or whatever. Uh, and so we want to introduce, uh, whether it's a DevOps process, a mindset about it, or we want to introduce a cloud native way of thinking about things, we want to introduce something where our developers uh, can start deploying every week, right? Uh, you know, the original DevOps dream, which I think is a great dream to have. The more frequently you can deploy your software, the more feedback you get about what works if you're solving the problem, the better you can make your application. And if you're doing it right, the better you can run your business, which, you know, a lot of people in the technical world don't care about how well you run your business until the business is running poorly, and then you gotta find a new business that's running better. Uh, so that kind of chain, uh, I think, is uh, very important. And yet, this is what people encounter all the time, is like, I've read all of the books, I've seen the talks, I saw this guy Cote talk about it, he talked about how it was awesome, uh, and so why aren't people just changing to it? What's, what's the deal with them? So, what I want to go over here is kind of understanding why people might, want, might not want to change, and then my current theory about who the culprit is uh, of, of why this change isn't happening. So first of all, uh, if you read anything about change management, uh, you know that any sort of corporate change management, regardless of YAML or anything else you're using, uh, fails about 70% of the time. This comes up over and over again uh, in, in the literature out there. Literature, uh, and, you know, whether it's from management consultants to academics or things like that. Uh, so it's pretty discouraging, right? And it definitely is something people pay a lot of attention to. However, what's encouraging is that if you go research this stuff, uh, you go look up where did this come from, there's actually, I think he's a British guy, and he's done several thorough studies that basically says that's a bunch of crap, right? Like we have no idea how frequently things change or how frequently they succeed. And just to give you a little preview, if you dig it up, that 70% figure comes from, I think, maybe 1991 in uh, Cotter and someone's book. And uh, if you read the passage, they're like, in our experience, I don't know, it's like 70% of the time. And there's no real sort of like studying or something behind, behind that. And it just has propagated through the decades. Uh, so what that means is that the first kind of way of, of getting over people not wanting to change is that like, we don't know if this is the case, because it hasn't been studied either, but in my anecdotal experience in 2024, maybe we can propagate this decades into the future, like organizations do kind of change. It's not exactly how you want them to change, but it happens, right? Over time, things do occur. It's not a uh, impossible hill uh, to go up. Now, let's figure out where this resistance to change comes from, like what the deal is. And since in the DevOps community, uh, it looks like most of you here are old enough to maybe have encountered this idea, so I won't explain the lore too much behind it. But, you know, we like our Star Trek analogies, all the way back to uh, that velocity talk, uh, as you may recall. And I think it's interesting to have a path of, there has been a lot of change driven by DevOps, so why is there this notion that people still aren't changing, right? Now, originally, way back when, it was like, we gotta get these two people, developers and operations, to talk with each other, and, uh, you know, here's how it happened at Flickr, so why wouldn't it happen this way at a 100-year-old insurance company in the future at some point? Uh, and I think, you know, this made a lot of sense, and I think, indeed, we actually have shifted over to this a lot, right? Like, now, of course, there's still plenty of infrastructure and operations people who don't talk with application developers very much, 
and application developers who think like, why would I need them? I can build all this on my own and all sorts of nonsense. But it is a lot better than it was in like 2010, 2008, right? Like the notion actually exists. Uh, things have gotten a lot better. And now over the past three or so years, we also had this idea. This, this change is eking out a little bit more slowly, but it is something that I encounter in the organizations I talk with. There's an extreme amount of interest in this DevSecOps, Dev, see I can't even say it, DevSecOps idea. I don't know why Sec got put in the middle. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever covered the, the kind of positional uh, thing of that. Um, but I was just talking with someone, a big bank processing uh, company, uh, late last year, and they had been putting this notion into place that, uh, and then even last week, or this week, I've lost track of time, uh, but there is this idea that the next bottleneck we have is security and compliance, and we're very aware of this bottleneck as something getting the software out, the apps out, so we need to solve that, and there's a lot of great work going on there uh, that, to, to solve this issue, so there's some resistance to change there, but it almost might be an instance of Planck's Law or notion about this is that eventually, I think Planck's law is a little more morbid, that change occurs in the sciences as people die. But you know, eventually the security people uh, sort of retire and uh, drive around in RVs or big Harleys or whatever security people do. I'm an application developer, so I have a lot of weird stereotypes in my head. Uh, you know, su surprising I'm wearing pants uh, instead of shorts and flip flops, I guess. Uh, now, of course, you know, Sticking to our Star Trek thing, this, uh, I guess to my point, the thing people forget about the security people in Star Trek is they tend to get eliminated. Uh, so that's a bit of a threat, I guess, uh, for them, but something they should be uh, aware of. Uh, make sure you're wearing the uh, correct color shirt. Now, let's get to the culprit. Like, when I talk with, with large organizations, this is what actually ends up being the barrier to change, right? Like, you go to the business side, right? The people who are running the organization, whether they are senior executives in management uh, up in, in IT, or they're actually people from finance, or they're the ones who own the businesses and run them. And if you work at a nonprofit like a government, I mean, just kind of rewrite the, uh, the words I'm using in your head to mission and helping citizens and things like that. But my experience uh, is that they're sort of the ones who have this really uh, kind of, um, what's the opposite of virtuous? Like a bad vortex, I forget the, the word you use there, a vicious cycle, uh, where they want things to be better, uh, and they talk about speeding up the delivery cycle and making things more secure, uh, and then uh, they're up on a stage, they talk about that, they might even give you uh, some books, some O'Reilly books just to come up here before you leave and take it from the box. They're saying, I'm not saying that. Uh, and then, you know, you, you go down and pick up the book and you look up and you have a question and they're gone, right? Like they just really haven't shown up. And so my current theory is that it's management, it's executives that are kind of like, the, the, not the final, I'm sure there'll be more, but they're the current bottleneck to get through to introducing things like DevOps and, uh, and change. And so usually with the room full of this, these notions go very well because most people are not these people and we really like making fun of them. Uh, so now we can, we can proceed into that, but more genuinely, I think there's kind of empathy and understanding of why management is a bottleneck, but maybe you can start to figure out how to apply uh, these changes and get through these bottlenecks uh, in your world. And so what we'll do is we'll dive into the wonderful world of management. Uh, and since I'm in California, this is, these are actually stills from a early 80s uh, California Institute of Correctional Facilities building planning uh, meeting, uh, which, which I got out, which I guess that's an interesting metaphor uh, to use for how you're building your IT systems. But man, look at that guy's hair and the glasses. It's just like perfect uh, for how things were running when I was a, uh, a kid. So here's the first issue uh, that, that comes up with executives and management that I think causes some bottlenecks. Uh, for things to change. And this is a notion, uh, there's a joke that one of my coworkers used uh, in looking at how an organization would transform. And their joke was that like, well, the amount of transformation you're talking about, the way we're gonna change how we're working, the budgeting, that's really a one and a half CEO job. And this comes from the notion that CI or CIOs change around every three or so years, right? Now, that's not exactly accurate. Uh, when you look at it, the, you know, at least with one study, the average CIO tenure is about 4.7 years, 
which is, uh, I'm a philosophy major, so I can't do math unless it's in Greek letters. But like, I think that's more than three. However, if you compare it to the CEO tenure, that's more like seven years, or you can think about yourself, your tenure at the organization you work at, right? And so there is this like rate of change that does cause uh, maybe the people in the organization to be like, that's nice. I'll talk to the next person when they come in here too, right? Like you don't really, you know, oftentimes when an executive comes in, they have new plans. Otherwise, why would you have a new one? And they want to change the way things uh, are operating. But there's almost this mistrust that you start having. So I think it becomes really important for management, for the for executive to sort of convince people about the stability of, of their desire for things to change. And then also when a new person comes in to maybe not just like upend everything, right? To kind of understand where you're moving from because Again, I'm sure the organizations you work in are fantastic and enlightened and over in that right part of the Western stuff. But lots of people I talk with are very jaded and they're just like, I don't think anyone's gonna change like, because they keep doing this every, every one and a half times. So the next thing uh, that is a uh, good perception change, and again, a bottleneck of people not wanting to change, not wanting to fear it, I think is often the perception uh, both in both directions that management has when it comes to managing IT people, right? Deciding where funding should be, deciding what groups, uh, uh, what grouping you should have. You know, if you think about the role of a manager, uh, especially a high up manager, like you can't really do that much except kind of report on the state of the system and kind of decide as if you've got one of those big maps in a, in a wooden pole where you're moving little things around. Like you don't have much control over things, so you have to reduce things down to metrics. Now, there was a great nerd fight last fall, if you remember, uh, that kind of exposed this problem in thinking that exists in a lot of organizations around developer productivity, uh, which I've been trying to think about, like, uh, is developer productivity, is that even a thing? Uh, well, of course, if you're a developer, it's not a thing. No one likes to be measured. I'm not sure if you've ever encountered this, but it's fine for other people to be measured, but when it comes to metrics for my job, that's impossible. What are you even talking about? Uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so as far as how I'm doing in this presentation, can't be measured, so it, it must be great. Um, but this, this exposed this type of thinking that I think management still hasn't come through, especially in non-tech companies. And this was put out by McKinsey. And the whole point of this was that uh, they say you can't measure developer productivity, and yet you need to because you need to allocate resources and optimize, which is to say get rid of people uh, and decide who to get rid of. Uh, so we propose the following ways of measuring developer productivity, even though those wacky developers keep telling us they're impossible to develop and we don't know what we're talking about. And so you can see most of these, the, the, the ones in red are the McKinsey ones, and you can see that they're about activities that people are doing and evaluating uh, the, the kind of worth uh, of the people there. And this is very common when you talk to management people because it's how they think. I'm not, I don't mean in a dismissive way, but it's data that they need that drives decisions they have to make about resource allocation and focus. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, I think as, as our friend over here said, that it's true, like what you do when you have a more thorough study of how uh, measuring developers, measuring people like yourselves, really what comes up over and over again, we keep coming up with like very, not very complicated, but different ways of describing it, is like, one of the better ways to measure productivity is to go ask individuals if they're happy. And if they say yes, they're probably productive, right? Like, you kind of don't have to mess around with, with mi very many other things. There's all sorts of internal metrics and measuring yourself. Metrics are great as long as they're your own. Once they go beyond your team, terrible. Don't do that. Uh, but you see this in some of the more recent work on the, uh, I guess it would be your right side, which I think is interesting. There's a lot of the uh, sort of like, the, the children of the DevOps report, uh, reports that have been coming out uh, uh, in, in those metri the, the other metrics that are great. But if you look through these, there's the classic kind of DORA and other metrics, your measuring output, if you will. But there's also a fair amount of metrics about like, are people just happy? Are they thriving? Are they in a good environment? And getting an executive to kind of do things in that way takes a big leap. And until you've shifted them over there, of course people are gonna fear change because again, the metrics that are being gathered are all about who's not gonna work here anymore. I guess on the positive end, they're about who gets a bigger bonus and promotions. But they, anytime you encounter a metric, it tends to be uh, not, not great uh, for employees. 
So then the, the next mindset for executives is just a little bit of like, uh, you can kind of figure out this puzzle, right? So that, that CIO comes in, or a higher level executive, uh, they feel this urge to change. And let's just look at, uh, incentive is an, over, uh, an overused word, but let's look at the reward structure. So this executive wants to change things over, and if you look at the risk benefit analysis, uh, if everything, st if they don't actually change, their compensation stays the same, they actually understand that if you don't change the way software works, the business is gonna uh, not function well. Uh, and so to them, the risk of not changing is high because the business is gonna uh, go poorly. And so, you know, it's not good if they don't change. Now often, if they do change and they're successful at changing the organization, they're gonna get famous, they'll get a promotion, they probably have a lot of equity in the company so their share price is gonna go up. Uh, and so while transformation, while changing is high risk, the payout is very good for executives. So they're incredibly motivated to change, right? Now if you look at an individual, it's not so great for an individual. You know, more or less, if you keep doing the same thing, you'll get compensated. Uh, if it doesn't change, you'll probably still have your job. Maybe, maybe like the company will do something else, someone else will come in, but like not changing, nothing generally happens. You keep kind of chugging along. And so that's kind of a great outcome. Uh, stability is nice. Versus if you do uh, spend time changing, are you gonna get paid more? Probably not, right? Like you probably, if you're like, if you're in most organizations, you don't have hu a huge chunk of equity. If you know what ROSU is, you're not in this position. Uh, but like, you're not really gonna get rewarded for it, except maybe like a cool hot dog festival uh, or something like that. Um, but the, the risk of changing is huge. Like you're moving to doing things in a new way, being with new groups. So it's all risk for an individual. Uh, and so really, is that valuable? Like probably not. Now here, I think it's pretty obvious what management needs to change, right? They need to have a reward for actually going through all of this change, which is kind of an impossible thing to ask, but it is like nice, right? Like, th I, and this is another, again, going over this is like, it's a bottleneck to change because why would anyone change? There's really no payoff versus what uh, you're already doing. I guess, you know, as technologists, we get really excited about new shiny objects and things. Uh, but again, culture is the real problem, not tools, uh, as, as I've been told, which I don't really think is too accurate. But, you know, so you might wanna learn new things and do stuff, but that's not really what a lot of large organization uh, changes. Now the final thing, or one of the final things, uh, is that I think one of the bottlenecks is just management knowing what they're doing, right? And like I was saying earlier, uh, you can't really do that much at a high level because you're not on the front line, or whichever line, metaphorically speaking, doing the work. And that was highlighted really well at a, a talk at DevOps Days uh, Dallas uh, a couple years ago where I think he was like, I don't know, at some point the chief architect of Lean or something at Toyota, and now a consultant. And he was saying just the week before that, he'd gone to this um, uh, corn distribution uh, factory, which is a fun analogy. And uh, the, uh, there was a new CEO who of course was the son of the former CEO. And in order to optimize that, so you know, you got a new executive coming in, they wanna make changes, uh, make things run better. Uh, the first thing that this consultant did was had the CEO go work on the line, uh, sorting corn. And I bet you can guess what happened like within 10 minutes, there were many changes made about how the work was performed, right? So it's a little bit to ask to have your, uh, your executives go in and like configure servers and program, but they need to think about like, maybe the people doing the work know how to optimize it, so I should let them do it or kind of have a notion of doing it. And yet, a lot of times uh, people come in and there's not a lot of uh, grounds up desire to change things around and you get this, uh, this corn sorting problem where the, the executive people have no idea how the corn is actually sorted. But that creates another bottleneck where just the ideas aren't, aren't, uh, aren't too great. So then the, uh, the, next, you know, the next thing I think is kind of a lack of, and this is more in the, the, the IT world, kind of a lack of vision, if you will, right, uh, that, that, that an executive has. Now, it's kind of nice to think about something like this uh, as, as a vision, right? Like as the goal that we have to simplify things. But this is not actually what this uh, person from DBS Bank was saying. Uh, I, I, I always like to bring this up because it's a very good, I think this is actually a function that an executive can have. Like what she was actually saying is that something that I think is a lot more tangible for DevOps people and developers 
is kind of setting this mission about what's the point of us doing this, right? You're trying to rally people being motivated to change, uh, not just optimize what they're doing, right? And, and what you can see here, again, I think is a, is a great goal. They're a bank, and I don't know about you, but after this talk, I'm not gonna log into my bank and just kind of hang out with it, right? Like, I don't really wanna spend a lot of time interfacing with my bank. And so if you have a notion like that for whatever organization you're in, I think it really helps guide you a lot in the changes that you're, you're making, right? And oftentimes, uh, to use a term of art, this vision is not that crisp, like the executives haven't thought through that in a, in a way to, uh, to motivate you. Now finally, uh, I wanna go over uh, another thing that is difficult to use, but I've noticed is very important and very helpful, and that is that a lot of people, especially in the DevOps community, uh, we, we kind of go too far on, on this notion that uh, my friend Bridget wrote up a long time ago, and that is that, uh, as I was joking about earlier, that whatever technology we use doesn't really matter, right? Which, in general, is kind of an interesting notion, but I think we lose out, uh, to remind you about platform stuff, of thinking about how do we change our technology around, and maybe even how do we use the constraints of a technology to help drive or even force uh, technological change, right? And if you have this notion that uh, uh, technology is easy and uh, people are hard, uh, then it's kind of easy to ignore selecting the technology you use as a way to force that change. And also as a side note, uh, you know, we're probably all technologists in case you just came here to pick up some free swag and stickers. Um, but just a pro tip, if you're in technology, you should never tell people technology is easy. You should always tell them it's extremely difficult, you barely can figure out what you're doing because it's so difficult, uh, and therefore that's why you should get paid a lot, right? Like you don't ever wanna tell people that what you do is easy and can be achievable. So remember, people are hard, well, outside of our community. So tell them that people are difficult, sure, but technology, whew, even more difficult, and I'm gonna need a raise uh, to deal with it. So. I see, like, when I see organizations put this platform in place, uh, what they're doing is they're saying, this is how they, they, we used to call this an opinionated platform. They're actually deciding this is how we operate, right? This is how you configure things, how you deploy them, uh, the middleware that you use. And I think that can kind of, if you pick the right kind of platform, it's an expression of how you wanna operate, right? And I think it's worth spending a lot of time thinking about that when you're picking the tool chain that you wanna use, the stack that you wanna use. Now, the issue becomes, how do you build a platform that people wanna use? And this is, you know, uh, a platform owner at Mercedes-Benz, and they have this notion, which if you've been following the, um, uh, as, as you recall, DevOps is dead, it's now about platform engineering, so hopefully you've been learning about that. And if you've been following what's been going on there, there's been this reemergence of this idea of platform as a product, and that is, managing the infrastructure or the platform as if it is, can you guess, a product. Now, the thing about a product is hopefully you have customers. Uh, and in that case, your customers, in general, are the application developers. And so when you're product managing your infrastructure, you know who your customer is now, the application developers, and it's a good idea to go ask, well, what would you like? Right? And, you know, instead of just thinking about how you are building up the infrastructure, how you're delivering it reliably to whatever kind of SL thing you, you want to use and okay whatnots and all the MB somethings, like whatever all those ways of thinking about it are, if your customers don't want it, who, it doesn't matter, right? And so this is a notion that I think is genuinely kind of new, at least in widespread use, is to, as you can kind of do he, think about here, go to your customers and ask them, so if you don't wanna use my platform, uh, what do you wanna use, right? And really product manage that. And probably in this, this community, like people know what product management is, but the great thing about product management is it's very well understood. Uh, product management is easy, people are hard, right? Like you can look it up and like get a lot of instruction about it. It's, there's, I mean, there's ways of messing it up just like there's a way of messing up frying eggs, but like, it's really hard to mess up because it's very prescriptive and there's lots of uh, proof behind it. So this is an example. Uh, this is a survey that I made sure we just made for free. Uh, but like, you know, you see people who are building, who are, have that kind of DevOps as platform, platform mentality, uh, putting up, uh, as you can see, figuring out how to connect together the network. 
Uh, but they go out and they ask the application developers what they're struggling with, uh, what, what they need help with. And that, generally, if you ask people what their problems are and you solve it, they generally use your technology and get beyond not wanting to change. But it requires that product management approach. And, you know, it generally works. Like, here's my ongoing collection of technical things of putting a platform in place. People are always kind of suspicious of a platform, but there's all sorts of uh, great proof points over the, uh, the years that it works, not only for uh, technical uh, effects, as, as you can see, but again, all the way back to the, uh, the business side of things, just achieving whatever your organization uh, wants with it. And then, uh, you know, if you're really interested in platforms, we have a great Cloud Foundry one you should check out. You know, I, I always know you're not supposed to uh, talk about how you get your bills paid, but I was at configuration management camp uh, the past two years, and I realized no one follows that rule. They, uh, they just suggest the solutions that they have. But if you want like a notion of what a platform looks like, you can look up that reference architecture. There's all sorts of platforms out there, and they've been built up over the years to really be that here's a tool you introduce, to get beyond people's notion of not wanting to change if you product manage it, right? If you on go think about how you build up and, uh, and provide this platform. Uh, and, you know, I think it's a, uh, it's a good way to uh, get beyond that, that fear of change. So hopefully that gives you a notion uh, and some understanding of if you're in an organization and uh, it seems like you and your friends or your work coworkers uh, have some notion of what would be great. You're getting this, this push from above uh, to do something different. And like seemingly month after month, year after year, things are just the same, right? Hopefully you have a few, a few things in a toolkit to go and kind of diagnose uh, what the issue might be and try to understand how to get through the bottlenecks and, and the barriers uh, that you would have. Uh, and with that, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I couldn't really see how much time I have left, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, I fully informed everyone. Oh. Sure. Any questions out there? That's the great thing about no questions is you don't have to come up with answers. Oh, there we go, yes. You were smiling a lot, so I'm gonna ask you first. Sure. So to, to summarize the question, I mean, you can tell me if I, I'm summarizing it uh, incorrectly. There are other forces in the organization, finance, maybe the corporate stewards, who they want to know how this is going to be good for the business. And when it's a business, that usually means, uh, well, two things, not losing a lot of money suddenly, and then also making more money. Uh, you just kind of being level is cool, but it's really not. They, they would like it to go the other way. So. Uh, well, first of all, it's a difficult problem. But I think what I've seen in organizations is there's two things. One, whoever is the champion of this, to use that phrase, they have to set a timeline expectation that it's going to be a couple of years to put this change in place, right? And they do, you need to do that because essentially, and, and I'll, I'll get over this silly saying, is like you've got to be successful first before you change over. But what that really means is you need to have a few wins. So like two or three instances of how we shifted over this way to operating and it resulted in a good, this is a fun word, fiduciary outcome, right? Like it, it, it actually made the business run better. And it kind of doesn't matter the size of that application, whatever that business is, you're just proving that working this way has a good result. Or to the cynical way, you're proving that it's not bad, right? Which in the zero sum game of corporate politicking, that's kind of a lot of what you're doing because someone else has got a great idea and if they can like eliminate yours, they get to do theirs. It's, I think of it as the, uh, you know, turn off the oxygen supply in the room and hold your breath the longest uh, is like how a lot of corporate stuff happens. Uh, so you spend the first year getting success on a few projects, working in this new way, and then you just market it a lot. Now, there's some other stuff actually in that Changing Mindsets book 
which is the only one you can't get for free. But if you have an O'Reilly account, you can get it or buy it. What a notion. Uh, uh, there are some things, if you get to some enlightened finance people, you can apply a lot of the ideas that we have in the DevOps and the, the, um, the application development world, that if you have shorter cycles, you have better risk management. Because if instead of a 12-month 12 window, 12 window of not knowing what's going on, you can have like a three-month window. And it actually is very responsible to course correct uh, instead of just like losing out on that. But that, that takes a little bit more finagling, maybe a lot more lunches with the finance people to uh, figure out uh, if they're interested in that. But yeah, I would just build up some successes. To use the old phrase, you know, uh, de uh, success is the best deodorant. Uh, you had a question? Uh huh. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. And I, and I guess one thing I didn't mention here is, is, is a lot of my operating theory here, uh, as, as you can maybe pick apart, is that management is like the programmer of the organization. Like, they're the ones who are building that system. And I think that the hands-off approach that we kind of want management to have in IT kind of plays against that notion uh, because we can't change the organization as a whole, so we need someone to come in and change it. Uh, now, getting exactly to that point, I think if you can't have financial uh, incentives and compensation, the executives need to figure out something beyond those you know, hot dog parties uh, to have as, as compensation, right? Whether that's like a nicer working environment, working less, uh, people working on things that they're enjoying, but you really gotta think about how do you incent people to go through the change? And I'll give you like one example, um, my, uh, 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 I don't know, to anonymize, but someone I know, uh, they were in charge of, get this, if you work in a large organization, you're probably not surprised, but you know, you've heard of auditors, but there's actually auditors for auditors uh, in organizations, and this person is an auditor for an auditor. And I remember one, one uh, Thanksgiving, uh, this person had to basically not take off Thanksgiving because one of the auditors for auditors had screwed up. And so they had to come in and fix that all up, right? So, you know, in this technical world, a lot of what auditors do is like, nowadays their tool chain is like Microsoft Office, right? So they're emailing things around and building up spreadsheets, but moving people to like a more DevOpsy way of thinking. You can go to the auditors and say like, well, we can automate a lot of this stuff. Like, you don't have to go and trust and, and talk with people and therefore work over, like, you know, your 40 hours or your 30 hours or whatever, right? So you're figuring out how you're going to improve the day-to-day -day life of the people who are changing rather than just, like, despite my spending time while, uh, less with banking vision, rather than just, like, delivering on the excitement of change that's going to benefit our shareholders and make sure that we can survive against the macroeconomic headwinds and things like that. But like, how do you really relate that down to what a, uh, an individual does? Now, of course, if you can do the financial stuff, that's great too. I don't know about y'all, but uh, money, always nice uh, to, to have instead of just All right, position. and with that, thank you very much, Kote. Yeah, thanks again. Can you give a round again. of applause?